Okay, so I'm just going to wrap up this unit with a quick section on showing you how to use what I call pre-trained networks, which will greatly expand the, your ability to build really complex, interesting models with deep networks. Okay, so the concept of pre-trained networks is that if you look at the really powerful, famous, deep networks, they generally have millions of parameters and much of the training usually takes days of training with clusters of GPUs. It's extremely expensive and it's very hard to reproduce those kind of results on your own. So the idea in pre-trained networks is that you can just download one of these famous networks and use that as a starting point. In the area of image selection, most deep learning packages like TensorFlow have a number of really powerful deep networks that can be used as a starting point. So this, uh, if you go to this link here, you'll see some of these um, networks here. And you can get deep uh, pre-trained networks in all sorts of domains. For example, for natural language processing, for speech recognition, for face recognition and so on. In this demo, I'll walk you through two of these networks, just showing you how to use them, VGG19 and Exception. Now, what you can do with a pre-trained network is not just use them for what they were originally intended for. These were both used for the image net classification, but as you're gonna do in the lab, you're gonna use a very important um, concept called fine tuning which is you can then repurpose that network with some small modifications for new tasks and that's what's really powerful about leveraging these fantastic pre-trained networks now the slides on the github site walk you through some of the history of these networks i'm not going to go through that i'm just going to jump right into tensorflow to show you how to use these powerful networks and get you started right away. Okay, so as usual, I've created a pretty simple demo to illustrate the concepts on the GitHub site. So you can clone that whole GitHub repository and run the demo there, but I'm gonna run it here on the colab.research.google page which case, again, as usual, you will not need to download anything onto your local machine. And in addition, for free, we're going to show you how also to get access to a GPU. All right, so what we do is navigate over to the Colab site, select File Open, select GitHub, and as usual, put in my GitHub page, HTTPS GitHub dot com slash sd rungan after you select that go to the class repository intro ml and go all the way down to unit 10 and the third demo on bg16 is what we're going to open up so after you open that up uh, we'll have the demo but before we start this time, what I want to do is activate a GPU. So one of the great features of Colab is that it provides free access to GPUs, which will speed up processing on deep networks. So what you do is you select edit and you go to notebook settings and then select hardware accelerator and GPU. You may not always get access if it runs out um, you'll get a message um, also you're not going to get a state-of-the-art gpu it's probably a gpu that's a few years old but it'll certainly be good enough for this demo so let's select that option um, you have to run it at select that at the beginning if you select it midway then you nearly need to run all the commands again okay we're going to then um, start with importing TensorFlow. So the first command as usual takes a little bit of time. Now, just to verify that we actually are running on a GPU, we there's a couple of ways in TensorFlow you can do that. You can use this syntax or command 
device lib, which will list all the devices. So if I run that, this makes sure that we're running with a GPU, give it a second, shows that there are CPUs available, but you see here that there's also a GPU device available. And it tells you the type of GPU, in this case, a Tesla T4. Again, it's not the most powerful one if you're probably building a virtual machine on Google Cloud or Amazon Cloud. I'd suggest you pick a more powerful GPU, but this GPU is free, so we can't really complain. Okay, um, I'm just gonna download some other standard packages like matplotlib and so on. Now we get to the pre-trained parts. So there are two networks here. I've written the demo for running a pre-trained network for one of two networks, Exception and VGG16. VGG16 was um, actually won, I believe, the ImageNet competition back in about 2014. So that was really state of the art at the time and it gets exceptionally good performance. Exception actually even does a little better on ImageNet, it just has more layers, although it has some optimizations in it to actually have less parameters. You can try either one, I've written the code so you can pick it. What happens in TensorFlow is that there are some uh, packages for each of these pre-trained networks. So we just go ahead and download that. And then to create a model, it's super easy to download this. You just use this syntax here. You say model, I want the VGG16 with the weights trained on ImageNet. So I'm gonna start running this. This might take a little bit of time because it has to download this actually on the collab, it runs super fast. On your local machine, it might take a little longer. So what it has done, it has actually created a network and then instead of having to train that network from scratch, it's taken the pre-trained weights that somebody had to spend a week to do on a very powerful GPU cluster and downloaded it into this model. So you get all the benefit of that training within seconds. Let's just take a look at VGG16. And you see here that it has a huge number of layers. Actually, if you count them, there are 16 of these layers. If you look at the history slides, you'll see actually that following VGG16, there was a tendency to networks with even much larger numbers of layers, like in the hundreds or over 100. But at this time, this was actually state of the art. And it uses some of those techniques that we saw on the earlier sections, convolutional layers, max pooling layers, and so on, just many, many more of them. And it has, you can see here, about 138 million parameters. So that would have been impossible for you to train without having a very, very specialized, <clears throat> powerful GPU cluster. Okay, but now we're just gonna be able to use that um, pre-trained network. So the first thing we need to do is I just, well, what I want to demonstrate this on is a set of test images. Now, to do that, I'm going to load some images into the virtual machine. You could do this automatically, but what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to create a folder as follows, just create a new folder, and I'm just gonna test it on a set of elephant images, but you can pick any set of images you want, so let's call it elephant. And then I'm going to upload some files into this folder. I just go click and upload, and I'm going to scroll over to this directory here, select these elephant images, which I've already created, but you can pick any set of images you want. All right, and it gives you a warning, that warning which I just quickly clicked off. It gives you a warning that after this virtual machine is closed, I'm gonna lose all these images. That's fine, I have it on my local machine. So we just uploaded them, but here there are 10 elephant images. You can put any images you want. All right, now that they're here, this little piece of code 
just um, I give it the directory and then what it does is it uh, finds all the files in this directory and it loads them in to a um, tensor which is staring these images as a batch. So let's just run this here and here there it goes. I've now downloaded these images and put them into this image batch X. All right, I've noticed here on this load image, I've given it a target size. So I've actually reshaped the image if necessary so that it fits the input image shape that the um, VGG16 network is expecting. So let's just look at the size of this batch. If I just print x dot shape give you an idea of this. You can see here that I have 10 images because I have 10 pictures of elephants. I'll show you what these elephants images look like. And each image has been reshaped to 224 by 224. And it has three colors because they're color images. So that is the set of images I'm going to run on this network. Just to show you them, I've created a little program very simple to display images and then i'm just going to pick four of them at random and print them or maybe the first four images not at random so here you see elephants so there's four images like this you can see these are quite complicated for example in some images there are multiple elephants there are also images where not the whole elephant is actually seen, or you might see the reverse side of the elephant and so on. These, these trained networks are so good, you're gonna see that it won't have any trouble recognizing that all of these are images. Now, in these pre-trained networks, they have to do a lot of sophisticated pre-processing. So to do that, I'm just going to run that those batch of images and create a pre-processed set. And that is a built-in function that came with VGG16. So exception would have had a different pre-processing, but great thing about TensorFlow is that it provides you all that pre-processing as well. You do not have to build this. Then after this, we can run the model through this and get the predictions. So let's just run this on this here. And it will take a little bit of time, even though it uh, um, uh, has the GPU. They, they actually, it also after this, it decoded the predictions, the decoding of the predictions. So what happens, actually, let's take a look to understand this. If I insert code cell. So if I print, the output of this. You can see here that there were 10 images and for each image it had a thousand dimensional vector. That's because ImageNet at that time had a thousand classes and so it was doing the final layer had a thousand way soft max. So it prints a thousand numbers and the, the index of the number which is strongest corresponds to that category that is most likely. The problem is that if I just print these thousand numbers, it's hard to associate that with what actual category it was. So this decode predictions function does that, it maps it back to categories which are human readable. And I actually tell it to pick the top three um, outputs for each of these predictions. Now, there's a strong, there's a complex actual data structure that this PREDS decoded has. I won't go through that, but if you walk through this code, it shows you here how to pick, print the class name and the probability for each of the decoded predictions. So let's just run that here. And I put it into a data frame and printed it. So this is what it tells us. It tells us here that the first image, the most likely was a tusker. So actually, ImageNet is so complex 
that it actually doesn't have just an elephant category. It has multiple types of elephants. So there's a tusker, an African elephant, an Indian elephant, and it tells you that with about 70% chance, it thinks that first image is a tusker elephant and 26% is African and so on. So in actually all of these cases, it seems to have correctly identified that it was an elephant. I personally do not know how to tell the difference between an African and Indian elephant or a tusker. So I can't tell you whether it's right or wrong. If there's anybody watching this video and can tell, that's great. Uh, you can put it in the comments, but see here that it was, it was a very challenging problem in times, terms of the fine grain nature of the classes that ImageNet had, and you can see that it does this perfectly. Okay, now that we have seen how to use this pre-trained network for a image classification, I want to quickly take a look at what happens on some of the intermediate layers. So just scroll over to this part of the demo and what I've done in this command here is I've grabbed just two layers in VGG16. This is the fourth block of the second convolutional layer and then the fully connected layer. And then I've created what you could call an intermediate model which takes the same input as the original model but then takes the outputs from these intermediate layers. And what this will let us do is it'll let us look at what happens when at some of these intermediate layers. So if we take our same batch of images and run it through this, in this case, actually, let's do this. <clears throat> if I print the length of Y, you'll see here that has a length of two because there are two output layers. So y of zero is the output from the first layer that I chose to pick off and y of one is the output of the second layer. Okay, so let's take a look here at the, <coughs> at the outputs of those two layers. So what this code does is for each of those layers, it plots the CDF, if you like, of the values of the coefficients or the magnitudes of those um, coefficients. Now, what you can see is that in both layers, about 75% of those coefficients are zero. And there's a few coefficients or a few cases which are very, very high. So in other words, the output of these intermediate layers is very sparse. And that makes sense because each one of the neurons in these layers are tuned to very specific features like an edge or maybe even something more semantically um, complex like a tusk or something like this, perhaps at a later layer. And in any particular image or any part of a particular image, that's unlikely to occur. But when it does occur, it provides a lot of information for the subsequent layers. So there's an inherent type of um, sparsity that you would expect. Now, if you go through the demo, you will see actually visualizations of that sparsity for different images at different layers but I don't want to spend too much time on that. This is come code, for example, picking out early layers, and you can see that most of the image is black at these layers corresponding to zero values, but occasionally you do see parts of white, and that's probably related to some specific features in that part of the image. As we go to Subsequent layers, the images have lower and lower resolution, but they have more channels. Presumably the localization is coming reduced, but you're getting more semantic information, right? If you walk all the way down here, you can see much lower resolutions and just a few of these neurons are being activated. There is actually an entire field in machine learning, which is very active, 
called interpretable AI, which tries to understand what these neurons are tuned for, but I won't go through that um, here. But if you want, go ahead and read about it. It's a fascinating topic. So that wraps up our unit on convolutional and deep neural networks. Just one last in-class exercise. I want you to try some own of your own images on this network and play around with it and see the kinds of results you can get. After you do this, go to the lab and in the lab you're going to show you, I'm going to show you how to do transfer learning, which is a super powerful technique. What it does, it allows you to start with one of these great pre-trained networks, and then you can fine tune just the last layer or two for a new task with very, very easily and get fantastic results. So that will really expand the universe of things you can do in deep learning quite easily.